get started. This is a regular scheduled meeting of the State Board of Canvassers. And unless I hear objection from Jonathan or any comments, this was properly posted. And we're going straight to number one, consideration of the minutes from March 23rd. They've been delivered to us with the committee's pleasure. I move that we approve the minutes from the March 23rd meeting. Yeah, we had a lot of votes that day. Is there support to the motion? Support. Move and supported. That was a four hour meeting. Any further discussion on the motion? Seeing none, all those in favor signify by saying aye. 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 All those opposed. The motion carries three to nothing. I look at this. Double fisted, two gavels. I've never been in a meeting where I got two gavels at once. It's kind of nice. Okay. Maybe you should share. <laughs> <laughs> share the I did not. There you go, Marianne. Okay, next item on the agenda, but I can get back to the agenda here. We have recalls. Uh, uh, Jonathan, take over for us here, would you? Thank you, Chair Shingo. This is a petition seeking the recall of Oakland County Clerk Lisa Brown. It was sponsored by John Love, who is a registered voter of Oakland County. Um, the reasons for recall printed on the petition uh, by Mr. Love are as follows, and there are typos, so I'm going to read it as I read it. Um, at April 6, 2022 Election Commission meeting, she violated the oath of office to support, quote, the Constitution of this state, end quote, Article 2, Section 1, where she rejected McKenney recall on a, quote, judicial question, end quote, basis prohibited by Art 2, Section 3. Okay. Uh, I see one time for the WHE. Section 8, sorry, not Section 3. Section eight. Do you have other uh, are there other things wrong with the words other than that one typo? Well, we flagged it for you as we saw it. I mean, there is um, there is an apparent misspelling of the word when. Mm -hmm. um, w H E. Uh, and then arguably there's some other grammatical things, but that's really for the board to decide. Okay. Uh, let's uh, have Mr. Love come on up. John Love. You testify, come right up to the microphone here, John. And what we do here is uh, swear you in. I'm going to swear at you, John. I want you to raise your right hand. You not only swear what you're about to say today is the truth, the whole truth. So, what have you got? If I don't swear, I won't. I can't talk. Well, you, it'll be noted in the records. Put it that way. Do you swear you're going to tell the truth? I don't swear to it. Yes. Okay. Thank you, John. Tell us about your recall petition. Well, the uh, president of Holly Village voted uh, to allow 22 marijuana facilities in uh, the uh, village. So I turned the petition in. Uh, then I turned in another one because they didn't like the first one. So I turned in another one. Uh, then it just became apparent that. Uh, they were violating the state constitution. And the, and the state constitution has several provisions. You have to take an oath of office that I will support the constitution of this state. And then on voters, it says, uh, it, shall, it says that the constitution shall be the supreme law of the state. So that means you can't pass laws that are in conflict with the supreme law of the state. Uh, on recalls, it says upon petition of electors. It doesn't say registered electors. It's very specific, electors. If you want, after that, there's a initiative and referendum provision that allows registered electors to sign the petition. So starting off, they disqualify anyone that is not registered. That's in violation of the specific language of the supreme law of the state of Michigan. But we don't bother with that because we got lawmakers and they'll fix that and make it more difficult than uh, it's uh, allowed. And you take an oath of office to support this. And have to, uh, also uh, provided a uh, copy of the, for initiative and referendum where it says registered electors have to sign 
a initiative or a referendum. So there's a clear distinction, but we don't worry about our oath of office. We're just going to disqualify uh, petitions. So this is what's taken place then. And the, in addition to that, there's a violation of the equal protection provision in the constitution. How can they do that? Oh, it's real easy. So what they do is for a recall petition, they have a form that has to be signed. If you have two people from the same county, one in the village of Holly and one in the township of Holly, you cannot sign the same petition. You have to sign a separate petition. And what do they do with the recall petition? They check every signature, every signature to make sure you're registered. When it says you, have, you, know, you shouldn't, people that aren't registered can sign the petition. Mr. Chair, if I may. Yeah. Pardon? Uh, if, sorry to interrupt, but I. Sure. Maybe I'm just completely off base. You're, you continue to reference Village of Holly, but we're, we're in the president there. We're dealing with an issue with the Oakland County clerk. And so I'm curious if you can get okay. to that point of this, because I'm, sure. I'm lost as to what Holly has to do with this. What Holly has to do with it is the first petition that I turned in was for the president's recall. These people that are uh, before you now acted on that petition illegally and disqualified it without giving a reason. Thank you. Okay. So it started out with A and, and they have established this system where it goes to B. And then your B in the case of these people. Yeah. John, one, one thing, um, we, we're used to this law that was passed in the December of 2012 and tried to mimic Wisconsin's law the best it could. And we've had lots of uh, problems with it. Uh, but our job here is to follow it the best we can. And it, even if parts of it could be wrong, it's, the courts can say it's wrong and throw it out. Uh, we don't really do that here at this level. Uh, and of course, the legislature can always uh, tweak it. We, we had a bucket list to give the legislature on, on some of the timing issues of this uh, recall law. But uh, you, you're, you're having problems with the law itself. I, I don't know. Disagree with many of them, maybe, but uh, right now we're looking at your words that whether we're going to approve this language or not. And our, our standard is, is a clear and factual. So that's what we're going to decide on. No, uh, and your, I, three, your three minutes bell went off, but keep going, please. All right. <laughs> I get three minutes to write the history of the world. Uh, I guess the point is that uh, at one time it was uh, illegal for people that were black to vote. And that was the law. So that uh, argument that, uh, you know, well, we're just following what Wisconsin did or what the office holders created to make sure that they were insulated is, uh, uh, you know, it's a valid argument. I'm just raising the issue so that you're aware of what has taken place because of the responsibility you have for oversight on this. So whatever they tell you to do, you do, but the same thing happened to the black people. Thank you. Yeah. Okay, John, real quick here. Your beginning of your sentence on April 6, 2022, at the commission meeting, uh, this is apparently when they turned down the local petition for recall. You say she, she uh, violated the oath of office to support the Constitution of the state of Michigan. So that that is uh, a statement. She violated the oath of office. But that is your opinion of what happened? Uh, absolutely. Okay. Because uh, I'm just a citizen mm -hmm. and I'm not entitled to have a opinion. I have to have some factual support of some kind for that. Well, that's, that's right. That, that is not necessarily a finding of fact. That is an opinion. Right. And that's where the distinction falls for me anyway. Okay. In trying to interpret so, this law. So as a citizen, I'm entitled to an opinion. And if it's supported by... Uh, people who signed the petition, that's the issue. Not, we're going to make a judicial decision that you're not qualified to do this. That's a judicial decision, which is forbidden in this recall provision. Now, the office holders don't like it, so they cook this stuff up. 
and then present it to you and you people just come in and punch the uh, issue. Okay, but that's what I'm saying. Anyway, I'm looking at this as you've got a, a, an opinion right here. Any other questions to the witness before he sits down? I'm done. Okay, uh, on this one, I think Lisa Brown is with us. Uh, Lisa, come on up. And here, Lisa, you are an attorney. I am. Oh, I very can... nice. Okay. And John, Not in that probably, capacity here. But because yes. she's an attorney, she doesn't have to be sworn in. Don't tell me why I don't know. But I'm an attorney. I'm happy. So I'm happy to swear that I will tell the truth. No, you attorneys are incredible. Well, or they've been disbarred, right? Okay, very yes, good. We Go have a higher, a higher standard here. You got the floor, Lisa. Uh, well, good morning, and thank you for um, allowing me to speak to this petition. Um, I think you've already seen what the issues are in this, and. Um, I can tell you on April 6th, the Election Commission of Oakland County did meet. Um, uh, Mr. Love uh, spoke when he spoke at the time that was supposed to be in favor of the language that was before us. Um, he said many of the things that he said today. Um, the language that's pre-printed on a petition, uh, which clearly the Election Commission at, at Oakland County has nothing to do with. Um, he uh, accused us of violating our oath of office before we even took any action. Um, and um, to this language, uh, it is um, an opinion. It is not factual. I take my oath of office extremely seriously. Um, obviously, there's a typo in it. There's grammatical errors. I kind of read it that I violated the oath of office by supporting the Constitution, uh, which <laughs> is an interesting take on it. Um, I'm not the only female on our commission, so saying she, uh, I think, could be um, not clear as well. Um, I, I, I did submit some written statements, so um, I didn't go after everything because, qu quite frankly, I really don't like typing. So uh, <laughs> um, I'm happy to answer any questions, but I think this language is not factual and it is not clear, and I ask that you deny this petition language. Okay, any questions, uh, Mrs. Brown? Mm -hmm. Thanks for coming in. Thank you. And that's it for this agenda item. Who people wish to speak? So we have uh, agenda item number two in front of us. What's the board's uh, pleasure? Well, we are required to find whether the reason on the recall petition is factual and clear. And as Mr. Love himself said, it is his opinion, but it is not a fact. And therefore, I would propose that we find um, that the petition um, does not factually state. Right. I move that the Board of State Canvassers determine that the recall petition filed by John Love on April 15, 2022, does not factually and clearly state each reason for the recall of Lisa Brown. Support. Moved and supported. Further discussion on that motion? I think the reasons have been uh, put on the record. Uh, all those in favor of the motion signal up by saying aye. 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 All those opposed, the motion carries. And now we have next on the agenda, a similar resolution. Uh, for, uh, Petition. Uh, John, you want to say anything about this one before I call on a witness? Uh, this is also a uh, recall submitted by Mr. Love. It's seeking a recall of Oakland County Treasurer Robert Wittenberg. Um, and uh, the reasons for recall stated on the petition are as follows. Again, there are some punctuation typos, but I will read it as I, as I read it. Um, at the April 6, 2022 Election Commission meeting, he violated the Michigan Constitution Oath of Office, Article 2, Sec 1, when he rejected a McKinney recall reason by a judicial action, Art 2, Sec 8. Hey, Mr. Love, you want to address this again? Your call. I'll say a few more. Come on up. I already swore at you once, so I don't need to do it again. Consider yourself sworn in. Thank you. All right. You have. Uh negated the uh, statements that I made on this petition in a uh, judicial fashion. So you've made a judicial decision on this. You've decided that what I put down 
was wrong. That's a judicial decision. So that's what's taking place here is you're making judicial decisions and uh, <clears throat> preventing the uh, uh, electorate from uh, getting too close to a circulating petition, which is certainly a uh, high calling to be doing that kind of thing. Uh, I served in Vietnam. I went through the, the uh, rigor, and then I come back here and find that this kind of behavior uh, unconscionable. A difficult petition form to circulate, to gather signatures for recall when you have a very easy form for people to go out and get office holders' names on the same access to the ballot. So this is what's taking place. And I understand that you have a uh, limited authority because uh, you're just following orders. And that's how they did it at, uh, in Germany. They just followed orders and proceeded. So that's my objection to what you're doing here. Okay. Thank you. Uh, on this one, uh, Robert Wittenberg. And come on up and uh, would you raise your right hand for me. You saw me swear to what you're about to say today is the truth, talk with nothing but the truth, love you, God. Yes. And what I failed to do for the previous two witnesses is for the record, please spell your name. Sir Robert Wittenberg, uh, R O B E R T. I'm sure everyone will get that. W I T T E N B E R G. Thank you. Go ahead. And thank you for having me. Uh, I am the Oakland County Treasurer, um, and I appreciate the opportunity to speak to all of you today on this uh, petition. Uh, the first thing I will say is uh, I submitted uh, written testimony to all of your or information to all of you. Uh, I've actually only been the treasurer since July 1st of 2021. Um, that is in state statute with counties of a population over a million and only for the treasurer. You don't take office till July 1st of the following year. Uh, so I was elected in November of 20 and didn't take office till July 1st. So I actually have not, been off, have not been in office for more than a year for a four year term, which means I am ineligible for recall at this time anyway. Um, so just wanted to let you know that. And so you have that information, but additionally um, to further Clerk Brown's statement, uh, we, we are not judges. We don't take judicial action. Uh, we acted as members of the election commission as part of our statutory duty. Uh, which is by virtue of the offices that we sit in. It's myself, the clerk, and the chief probate judge uh, that sit on the commission. Um, for his uh, petition that he submitted to us, regard the original one regarding Holly, uh, we all agreed, all three of us, uh, that it wasn't sufficiently clear and factual. Uh, in his recourse, my thought is that his recourse could have been to appeal our decision to the courts uh, rather than trying to recall us for actually trying to do our duty. Um, and then the language itself uh, that is before you, it's not clear as it doesn't clearly show uh, which section. Uh, it, it was hard to tell because there were things crossed out, which section it's referencing. Um, you know, some of the, the obviously the, the grammatical mistakes. Um, so I think those are kind of the, all the different reasons why I would, I would encourage all of you to deny this petition today. Um, in essence, we are at the county level doing exactly what you're doing at the state level uh, and just trying to fulfill our, our, our duty. Um, so that's that's all I would uh, present to you all today. And I appreciate the opportunity and I'm happy to, happy to answer any questions, any questions as well. For Robert? For me. Oh, thanks for coming in. Thank you. Thanks for having me. Jonathan, uh, I wasn't aware that clerks or treasurers don't start until, what, seven, eight months after they're elected? Wow. So yeah, that, sorry, I, I can ask. That's only for counties with a population over a million with a particular governance structure. So it well, actually many, might only be Oakland. It might be Oakland. Wayne, so that, that's a whole other thing. Wayne, I don't know that answer. We have to actually, if anyone here wants to do the research, because our, our governance structure is different in Oakland than it is in Wayne. Uh, I don't even know if their treasurer starts, but this is something that it's Oakland County. Uh, so I was elected in November of 20. Uh, and then took office July 1st of 2021. So you didn't get paid for that six months? Uh, not in that position. I actually worked in the office part-time. I was hired in part-time so, so I could hit the ground running July 1st of, of 2021. 
So anyway, so, so a statement that he couldn't be recalled because of the nature of when he started the position, is that a correct statement? Uh, I'd like Eric and or and or Adam to answer that question. Okay, sure. I think we've researched this. Sure. Okay. So I'll and then I'll jump in and then if Eric, if I say something incorrect or that Eric wants to clarify. So um it, it's a complicated answer like most things with recall are. So there's two different sections of law that are happening. So you've got the first section of, of um, the recall under 951, which says that candidates who serve in a four-year term are not eligible. Um, a recall petition shall not be filed against an officer during the first year of their term in office or the last year of their term in office. So that's the, the starting point. Um, but then there's section 952B, which says that a petition for recall shall not be submitted, but that the language can be submitted after six months of them being in office. So I, reading those two together, believe that you can serve language, you can file language for approval at the factual and clarity hearing in a four-year term between that six month and one year period, but that the petition itself with the signatures cannot be filed until at least one year in. Uh, to the officer's term. I would defer if I said anything. No, just the, just to clarify, uh, section 952B, what it says is that a petition for the recall of an officer shall not be submitted to the Board of State Canvassers under 951A, uh, and it talks about county commissioners under a separate section, if the petition is factual and of sufficient clarity until the officer has actually performed the duties of the office to which elected for a period of six months during the current term of that office. Oh, that means this, this, then this is qualifiable then. The, it's the, if he's been in office for six months, he can submit the language for the board's approval. Right. But as Adam said, uh, the petition itself could not be filed during the first year of his office. Does that mean it could be circulated in the second six months, but then filed? Maybe it doesn't matter <laughs> because it might be easier just to rule on the factual question rather than least, on whether or not it's possible to. At, at least as, as the statute is written, if, as long as the treasurer has been in office and actually been performing their duties for a period of six months, then he can submit it to this board for a review of the factual and clarity of the petition. Okay. okay. Uh, yes, sir. What would you like to say? Uh, I, for the reasons that have been laid out and that are virtually similar, if not identical, to the, the previous about the lack of factual and, and, and clarity, the typos. Uh, I move that the Board of State Canvassers determine that the recall petition filed by John Love, Love on April 15, 2022 does not factually and clearly state each reason for the recall of Robert Wittenberg. Support? Support. Move and support. Further discussion on that motion? Now you have something you want to say? I just want to read the names. I can't read the names of who's up here. I'll tell you, we're all, if you grab a copy of the minutes, you're probably outside the door. We're all in there. So, oh, but I just wanted to see who the name Tony, was. Tony? Because it wasn't on this. I brought him in, but I didn't. I can't read who was speaking. Oh, okay. So I just came up to see what okay. the name was of who spoke. Okay, very who good. Who proposed this? And I see he's not a member of the commission. I don't know. Anyway. Would you like to say something on the record here, John? Well, I, oh, you're standing at the podium. I just wanted to do I just talk. was wanted to make a note. You want to make a note? Okay, very good. So, thank you. We're ready to vote. I think all those in favor of the motion. See why we're saying aye. 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 All those opposed. The motion passes. Uh, next, we have a third recall petition. Uh, Jonathan, you want to tell us about it? Thank you, Chair Schenkel. This is uh, a, re a petition seeking the recall of Genesee County Clerk John Gleason. It's sponsored by Isaac Thomas, who's a registered voter of Genesee County. The reason for recall printed on the petition by Mr. Thomas is as follows, and I'll note that this also has um, some apparent typo issues, but I'm going to read it. Um, the state of Michigan has charged John J. Gleason with one count of bribing, intimidating, interfering, which is a four-year felony. Okay. And did, did he submit anything with evidence of that charge? 
He submitted a uh, copy of, not, I, I can't really verify what this is exactly, but it appears, what do you think it is? A charging document? It, it appears to me something like a print off and this is just a speculation, but if you go to like the court's website, you get the register of actions on a court, like it seems like something like that. Um, and it's the, it's uh, in tab four, it's the last page in so, tab four is what he submitted. So, so this is it, correct. what he submitted, okay. That's correct. And uh, anyone else wanna comment on what they think this is? I would just su support my interpretation is what Jonathan, or I mean, uh, Adam said. Some form of official document listing yeah. these charges. And of course, this information was in public. Have we heard various. from the petitioner at all today or before? I have heard from him. Um, he has emailed us, uh, not as, as far as whether he was going to come here to speak or not. I have not heard from him. He emailed from the document that you have. Well, this document, uh, does it say he's been charged? In your opinion? Uh, that, that's a question for me, Chair Chicago. I mean, I am not um, a criminal uh, lawyer. <laughs> I'm not particularly experienced in the criminal system. I mean, it appears to me to have John Gleason's name on it and has some listing of charges. Um, but, you know, I, I can't verify, um, you know, I, I can't verify the veracity of this or, or whether these are the exact charges filed. I mean, I, you know, as, as Member Don indicated, this has been in the public. I'm, I'm certainly aware of it. But, um, you know, I... I can't really speak to whether this supports everything that's in the statement in the recall language. From a, if I may, from a uh, WJRT TV 12 in Flint um, news report dated April 8th, it states, Genesee County Clerk John Gleason has been arrested on multiple charges, which potentially are related to an investigation that began in 2020. Police took 67-year-old Gleason into custody without incident at his office on the second floor of the Genesee County office building. He was immediately taken to the Genesee County Jail and booked. Gleason has been charged with witness bribing, intimidating, interfering, and willful neglect of duty, if convicted, et cetera, et cetera. So I, I take that to be a fairly concrete um, concurrence with with what is stated here, obviously there's the issue of the the typo, the misspelling. I know in previous is, you know, previous recall petitions before us, that has been an issue where we've we've sought you know correct spelling in grammatical punctuation. Um, I if my memory serves, it was more uh, those were more related to some of the substance being discussed as to, you know, the word which, um, so. I agree with that, it was substantive. If the typo goes to changing the uh, intent of what the sentence does, I don't think this one does. So what's the, what's the board's pleasure on this? Just saying that he has been charged with bribing, intimidating and interfering um, seems to me to be unclear because it's very incomplete. Um, I think the charge, um, as uh, Member Don just said, was witness bribing, um, intimidating, and interfering. And, and this um, sim certainly does not limit, there are no limiting words here with regard to the bribing, intimidating, and interfering. And I think it's quite unclear. It's certainly true that he has been charged. Um, uh, and I believe he was charged with two counts, but um, but I don't think that this is an accurate statement of what the charge was. 
Well, it's tough for us since we don't have a petitioner here. Uh, and we have this one piece of paper that, and that's what it is, one piece of paper that no one is saying exactly what it is. And there's no explanation of what this paper says. He just sent this piece of paper in with no cover letter? He sent it as a, it was a screenshot via email. The screenshot via email? Yes. Yeah, I, I mean, I, I think to a degree, what this has laid out is, is much closer to factual information than, uh, with all due respect, sir, what the, the previous two um, did. And I think that's one thing folks should keep in mind, stick to the very basic facts. You don't need to give a reason as to why those facts make you want to recall them. Um, but it, if this individual is not here to help clarify this, um, and, and there is a typo, I, I think, I, I think that, you know, I, I prefer to get it 100% correct than, than make assumptions here. So. In that regard, I move that the Board of State Canvassers determine that the recall petition filed by Isaac Thomas on April 20, 2022 does not factually and clearly state each reason for the recall of John Gleason. Their support. Support. The movement supported that this uh, petition does not factually and clearly state correct reasons. Uh, any further discussion? Okay, all those in favor of the motion, see what I'm saying, aye? Aye. All those opposed, and the chair is going to vote no. So it's a two to one vote, but it fails. So, Jonathan, what else we got on the agenda? So that takes us to other business, uh, Chair Schenkel. There's two items that I would like to um, just raise for the board, um, discuss with the board. Oh, sorry, I have one more. I apologize. I skipped ahead. Uh, thanks, Adam. We have one more item, which is that we do have tomorrow, uh, we have special elections that are being inducted um, in Wayne, Macomb, Oakland, and Kent counties for um, state house districts. Um, after that election, um, the, it, it will be the boards of county canvassers that are canvassing and certifying those because they're all districts that are wholly contained within each one of those counties. However, um, if there are recounts that are filed with the Bureau of election, Elections, uh, we would need to conduct those and we would need the board's permission to do so. So for that reason, we're asking uh, the board to authorize the Bureau of Elections to um, represent the board in any recounts um, for any of those four races if, if the recount is filed. Okay, Thank you. what's the board's pleasure? I move that the Board of State Canvassers authorize the staff of the Bureau of Elections to represent the board in any recount of votes cast for the special general election being held for the Office of State Representative in the 15th, 36th, 43rd, and 74th districts. Support. Support. Moved and supported that uh, Bureau of Elections represent us in these elections. Uh, any further discussion on the motion? Seeing none, all those in favor of the motion, see what I'm saying, aye. 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 All those opposed, motion passes three to nothing. Uh, other further business. You want to tell us about this, uh, all these counts on petitions that you're doing right now and how it's going and what we're going to get here in a couple of weeks? Yes. Um, I would like to just take a few minutes to just sort of go through the process um, that the Bureau is going to follow in making a recommendation to the board. Uh, for all these nominating petitions. Um, and I will just say, you know, there's obviously been a lot of media coverage and public discussion about all these challenges. I'm not prepared yet. We're not prepared yet to make any recommendations to the board about the merits of any of those challenges. But I, uh, we need to, you know, take our time to review those. But I do want to just go over the process that will apply to all candidates equally as we are making a re recommendation to the board. So, um, the candidate filing deadline uh, for most offices is April 19th, and um, the board must decide on whether nominating petitions contain a sufficient, sufficient number of valid signatures by May 31st, and the Secretary of State must certify those candidates to the ballot by June 3rd, which is 60 days before the August primary. That's under Section 552 of the election law. Um, in addition to that being the legal requirement, it's also practically important because counties need time to get all the ballots programmed, all the proofs generated, 
reviewed, any errors corrected, and then all the ballots printed and distributed to the jurisdictions in time to get ballots out for the 45-day military uh, ballot deadline and also the 40-day uh, absent voter ballot deadline for those who have requested them. So the schedule already leaves very little time for that to happen. So we have scheduled a meeting on Thursday, May 26th, for the board to act on these nominating petitions. That is two business days before the May 31st deadline, because Monday, uh, May 30th is Memorial Day. Um, so really, the sooner decisions can be made, the better, so that we can have finality who's on the, about who is on the ballot. There could, of course, be lawsuits. Um, but you know, and generally speaking, election officials in the Bureau uh, always ask for those things to be decided as soon as possible and if possible before any ballots are printed so that there can be clarity and resolution going in um, to what is already a tight timeline to get ballots out. So as far as the nominating petitions go for August, the board will primarily be considering nominating petitions for gubernatorial candidates, congressional candidates, and judicial candidates. There may be one or two state rep or state senate nominating petitions, but the vast majority of those candidates will do a filing fee. So you don't, you don't look at nominating petitions for that. Um, they also submit an affidavit of identity, um, which is the candidate filing document, and the, and the Secretary of State Bureau of Elections are the filing officials for the affidavit of identity. So we're also getting um, some challenges to candidates' affidavits, but those aren't about the nominating petition, those are about the affidavit of identity that the candidate files when they run. Um, Can we look at those? Well, the, those are those are reviewed by the Bureau of Elections and the Secretary of State because the Secretary of State is the filing official for the affidavits okay. of identity. So that they don't come in front of us. Right. Okay. So we make a determination on that. So, um, so, but for the board to make its determinations about the nominating petitions, the Bureau of Elections will make a recommendation to the board for each candidate. Um, and to prepare that report for each candidate, uh, first we review the petition sheets for all the candidates and we look at every page, every line. We don't use random sampling for candidate nominating petitions as we do with initiative petitions. So first we review all the sheets for things that would make every signature on the sheet invalid. So that would include um, you know, not having the candidate's name listed on the petition, not having the office sought or other errors in the heading that would disqualify every sheet. Or every signature on the sheet. It could also be, for example, a sheet that doesn't have a signed circulator statement. When we're going through, if we see any errors like that, that invalidates every signature on that sheet. Um, we also look at every line um, and we eliminate signatures that are invalid um, individually. So that could be a duplicate signature. It could be someone who didn't sign. It could be someone who lives on an address outside the city or township they listed. It could be that they live in a city that's not in the county. Uh, on a countywide form that's used. Um, there could be a signature that was collected too early um, or without a date on it. Um, it could be a signature after uh, the circulator signature. All of these things are laid out in our, in our document, which is online, which is entitled Nominating and Qualifying Petitions. So that's available at the Michigan Department of State website, uh, which outlines this entire process. And you have a copy of that, but just want to make clear that that's available to the public. Um, so, um, you know, at that time, we would also review any signatures that appear suspicious. So if there's any evidence that a signature was forged or anything like that, we would review those and, and we would toss any signature for that reason um, if it were a forgery. So we would then take all those out and count up the remaining valid signatures. And there's a different number required for each office, which is described in the document that I just referenced. Um, and then we would make a recommendation to the board about whether or not to certify. Now, at the same time, um, others can challenge uh, other candidates' petitions. So it could be another candidate, it could be an opponent, um, can bring a challenge and, and explain why they think signatures should be thrown out. And they can basically do that. And we've received, I think, 28 challenges uh, combined. When you look at gubernatorial, uh, congressional, and judicial candidates, we have a total of 28 challenges. That is, I think, more than we usually have. Um, so that will be um, a lot for us to work through, but that's what we have. Um, and people can basically challenge signatures for all the same reasons that BOE would toss them. So when's the deadline for that? The deadline for that was May 20 or April 26th, 5th, 26th, 26th, There's April 26th. One, one week after the file. Yeah, yeah. So, um, and so people can challenge all those signatures for the same reason that, that we do, you know, it could be something wrong with the heading, could be saying somebody who signed the petition is not eligible. Um, that the, the person who signed is not registered or if they think there's fraud. 
And we'll look at each of those challenges and we'll do one of three things with those challenges. First, um, and this is pretty common, it could be a valid challenge, but it could be something that we already identified it throughout so that we note that, but it doesn't change the number. Um, the second thing is it could be a challenge that we don't agree with. So it could be, for example, someone who says, well, this isn't valid because they uh, didn't write the city on there, but they wrote GR you know, for Grand Rapids, which is something that we accept as an abbreviation for Grand Rapids. So sometimes people will challenge things, uh, but we will just disagree with it. Or it could be a signature that they don't think is clear or matches, but we think that it does. Um, and then the third category are things that we do agree with and that we didn't initially identify. So it could be something the challenger caught that we didn't. So a bad signature or some other error we missed. Um, if we review that and we determine that that's a signature that should be thrown out, we will do that. Um, and then also keep in mind that the candidates uh, who are challenged can also respond to those challenges and they can rebut the arguments that were made. And I think, do we have a deadline for that, Adam? It's coming up. 10 days from when it was sent. So most of them are May 6th. Okay. So thank you, Adam. So we did notify all the, the candidates who were challenged of the challenges against them. And they have until May 6th to respond to that. Um, they, may, they may make legal arguments, you know, countering why something that, that was maybe a formal defect or allegedly a formal defect actually should be included. We may agree with the candidate. It could also be a, a, a signature that they rehabilitate. So for example, it could be somebody who, um, you know, we had determined or a challenger had determined the signature didn't match, but they may produce evidence that it actually was the voter, the, you know, the voter perhaps had an injury or disability, so their signature had changed. Um, so they have the opportunity to rehabilitate those signatures. Then ultimately for May 26, we look at our initial review, we look at the challenges, and we look at um, the, um, uh, you know, our review of that and the responses to that, and then we come up with what we think is the number of valid signatures for each candidate, and then the board decides for each candidate whether they have enough. Um, and if they do, if the board decides that they do, then they um, make that determination, and then the secretary will certify them to the ballot. Um, you know, if, if we do get, um, you know, and then finally, if there are signatures that do appear to be fraudulent or otherwise, obviously those signatures don't get counted. It's also possible for those to be referred for prosecution um, for criminal review, but that obviously wouldn't be something the Bureau of Elections uh, prosecutes. Um, it is the board's decision, ultimately, whether the signatures match. Um, so, um, you know, ultimately, that was what the board has to decide on May 26. So, Adam, if you want to add or clarify anything I said, that's basically the process we're going to follow. Uh, so I'll just say at the board meeting itself on the 26th, the only thing that I'll um, add is that it'll be taken in two prongs. Uh, there will be a batch of candidates where there's no challenges and there's no issues with their petitions that you will vote on and just put through um, that we rec we don't have issues. We're recommending that they be certified. So you'll certify the entire candidate listing and then we will take one by one every candidate that we um uh, have to do a staff report on whether there's ch challenges, regardless of the recommendation with the challenge, or uh, whether during our review we uh, flagged issues with the petitions themselves. So it usually is a lengthier meeting um, for that reason, because we have to take each one of those challenges as an individual agenda item. Um, but that's how the the two prong. Can you bring Chipotle for us for lunch, please? We will be. We will uh, get you guys lunch for that meeting, <laughs> possibly dinner as well. Yeah, who knows. <laughs> What is the final deadline for uh, get in May 6th or uh, is that May 6th? May 6th is when the challenge we've given. So the challengers were supposed to submit their challenges by April 26th. And we notified the candidates, the candidates who want to respond to any of those challenges and rebut those arguments need to do so by May 6th. And then we will have 20 days to get the reports to you all. So or actually, not 20, because <laughs> we're going to do it several days before the meeting. So, so you're, you're done receiving things as of May 6th. And so you're going to be working from May 6th until our meeting or before our meeting. You think, well, you don't know when you get them to us, but when you get some of them done, you'll get them to us. We don't need them all at once. But I would suggest that when you've got a staff report completed, fire it up to us, sense. you know, so we don't get them all at once. Yeah, we will definitely do our best to get you our, our reports as soon as we possibly can. We will probably need as much of the time as we can get to get through all these, but Certainly, we will do the best we can to get them to you early. Yeah. Any other questions? Yeah, I have a question. Um, you said, Jonathan, that you look for evidence of forgery. Um, 
So I know that evidence of forgery has been submitted by a number of the challengers. And I wonder how, if you can tell us how you investigate those allegations. Well, one example would be, um, you know, if, uh, you know, an obvious example would be just everything's written in the same handwriting. You know, someone has just written a bunch of names and signed everything in the same handwriting. That that clearly indicates that it likely was forgery, but we would still check the qualified voter file just to be sure, to make sure that the signatures didn't match. So, you know, it, it, perhaps one of them was a valid signature and, and they had forged the rest or something like that. Um, Can I interrupt? Yeah, sure. Are you checking the signatures against the QVF? Whenever we we see evidence that the signature may not match, we will check. And, and so we will always use QVF before we eliminate a signature. And if you have evidence that some petition circulators um, have forged at least some signatures, do you check all of the signatures that have been circ um, that are on those circulators' petitions? We scrutinize them more closely. I don't know, Adam. Do do you, can you speak to the process of whether we will always? I don't know if I can say we always will check every single one, but we definitely scrutinize. The signature is very closely if, if we have evidence that the circulator is submitting bad signatures. And then also the candidates are challenging those as well. So we may also review them in the context of a challenge. Is that if, accurate? Yeah, I would agree with what Jonathan said. If you know that some circulators have submitted fraudulent forged signatures in connection with one candidate, do you examine the signatures submitted by those circulators for other candidates? Yes. And is, is there, in this process, is there ever any instance of calling the individuals listed as having signed and asking them that they have, have you signed this or, or is that more something for those making the challenge to do that and get affidavits and things like that? I don't believe we con have ever contacted individual voters. Um, that could be something that challengers do if they choose to do so. It could also be something that, as I noted, sometimes the candidates who are challenged will try to rehabilitate their signatures. So we've had cases in the past where candidates have gotten an affidavit or something from a voter that says that, yes, that actually was my signature. And, you know, I had a, I hurt my wrist or, you know, something like that. Um, and so that's something that candidates do. But we don't, as a matter of course, contact every voter. And then one more from me, just that I get this often asked of me in terms of duplicates where, you know, if somebody signs more than one for an office. It's my understanding that the it's the one that was submitted earliest counts if there is proven duplicate, unless they're submitted at this, if they're submitted on the same day, then neither count. Is that correct or? So I just want to be sure about with language. It's not submitted, not the candidate submitted. It's whenever the voter signed, whatever right. the yeah. voter signed first. Yes, sorry. Mm -hmm. So that, I, I assumed that was what you meant. I just yep. wanted to make sure. So and that's, uh, and that's in the context of if somebody signed petitions for two different candidates for the same office, right. if there's only one office available. So do you make any attempt to contact circulators where there is an assertion that that circulator has forged signatures? I don't believe that we have done that in the past. Is um, that something that you might do in the present? I'm not sure. I'm not sure if we would. I think that's something we want to talk with the attorney general about. I mean, if there's going to be any kind of investigation, um, that might be something that's better handled by law enforcement. Um, so I don't know the answer to that question. I, I, I don't believe at this time we have any plans to do that. So you, you said that you would be giving us the information as you go along. Um, are you doing it in any particular order that the like challenges? Processing them. Um, uh, we have a number of uh, staff working on a variety of different ones, um, and it's I just pull them in the order in which they're received. Um, but it depends on who finishes what, because if it's a more complex challenge, depends on the issue and things like that. So um, it, it's it's usually processed in the order in which they are received is how we process the challenges. Um, and. But the staff report could vary when the staff report comes out, depending on the complexity of the staff report. 
if the challenge, for example, is a challenge to they left the petition heading blank, that's very different than um, all of these signatures themselves are being challenged. That's more time consuming to, because we have to look up all of those and things like that. So the staff report um, has to go to the public by what date? Uh, two full business days prior to the board meeting. So it will, it has to be up, I believe, Monday, that Monday April 23rd. I'm looking up a calendar real quick. I think the way we interpret that is the end of the Monday, right? Yes. 26th. Yes. So it would be by the end of the day on, on Monday, May 23rd, excuse me, because um, it would have to be up and made available to the candidate and the public um, for two full business days prior to the meeting. And so that's under the law. If you have a staff report finished earlier than that date, would it be made available to the candidate and to the challenger? You said it would be made available to us. Yeah, I mean, we haven't we haven't talked about that. I mean, typically what we do is just release the staff reports for all of them at the same time. So I don't believe that in the past, I mean, I haven't been here for that many election cycles, but I don't believe in the past that we have released them on a rolling basis, but that's something that we can talk about and see if it's feasible. You know, as long as we can do it in a way that is consistent. Okay, not to, sorry, not to continue. Sure. That, that just created a question in my mind of the when those staff reports are submitted, then is there a like, re, like aside from coming to meet, is there a rebuttal process of actually, you know, you're, you're way off base? Um, so by doing them early, would some get an advantage that others wouldn't have in that? Or is that not an issue? There's their only recourse is to come to the meeting on the 26th. Well, I mean, I think that's an interesting question. It's one of the things I think we should think about because if you do have more time, then both the candidate and the person opposing the candidate there would have more time to look at that and review it, you know, before the board meeting. So we will often get, um, you know, people who want to speak to the to the petitions will often come, you know, speak in person, but also submit uh, reports and writing to the board. There's, you know, that all happens very fast because um, our staff reports released on Monday and then the, the meetings that Thursday. So that would that would change the review period after the staff report and before the board meeting so that it would be different for different candidates. If, if I may, some, something in my mind would be if if we as we continue this discussion, if something's if we're going to get something four days instead of two, that they be all of the same office, as opposed to some of the congressional, some of the gubernatorial. That way, other but it's a gubernatorial issue. Some can't say, well, they had four days to fix their problems. We only got two. That's not fair. I can see that being a substantial issue. Yeah, I think I think we should discuss that and and determine what we could do consistently, because I, I do want to make sure we treat all the candidates the same. When a candidate has a, a signature challenge, they know about it. The challenger yes. sends you a copy and them a copy. When, when you have a problem with a signature, do they know about it right away or do they wait for staff report? I believe they don't know until the staff report. That's right. Okay, well, therein lies a, a small problem with timing. They don't have time to react to your problems that you find until maybe two or three days before our meeting. That, it'd be nice to get it out to them if you got problems with it sooner, sooner yeah. or later. That's certainly true. I mean, the reality is we have hundreds of petitions we have to review. We don't have any time. I mean, we don't really have the ability to process these any faster than we do. So, okay. I mean, yes, we do them on a rolling basis to some extent, but, um, you know, we we can't do everything any faster than we're doing it and provide everyone the information at the same time. We can't accomplish both of those things. Come on, Jonathan. <laughs> <laughs> it, oh, boy, anything else? Yeah. If you have allegations that 7,000 petition signatures are forged, do you have the ability um, to, to check each of those signatures with the QVF? Um, yourself with the bureau staff, or could you secure other assistance? We bureau staff review the QVF. We have access to it, and when we when we do QVF reviews, that's done by bureau staff. Okay. 
Okay. So if, uh, one other thing that I wanted to raise, um, also in light of both the May 26 meeting and also other upcoming meetings, um, is just the board's policy on um, public comment. So what the board has been doing um, is having a separate public comment period essentially for every agenda item, um, as opposed to having a public comment item um, at the, for example, at the beginning of the meeting. And typically, I think with other bodies, it's more common to have a public comment period at the beginning where individuals who wish to speak on any item can do that, um, or multiple items can do that during the public comment period. And um, they can, of course, also submit anything in writing in addition to what they say on the record. So um, in light of especially the upcoming meeting on the 26th, where we're going to have at least dozens of items and dozens of speakers. Um, I think there's a potential for that kind of to be an unsustainable practice to have a individual public comment on each item that's unlimited because of the uh, sort of round robin factor there with commenting. So um, I think the board should consider um, changing the, the, the way public comment is handled essentially so that you have public comment at the beginning where anyone can speak on any item and then when you get into the agenda items, the specific agenda items, um, the chair, you know, at the chair's discretion <coughs> recognize the, um, the, the subject of each item and the challenger um, so that they would have, you know, the board would have the benefit of the specific information about those items. Um, and then also the benefit of, you know, whatever public comments had been submitted at the beginning. So, so I, yeah. if, if we had a governor candidate number one, is being challenged. And there's a whole bunch of people that support this governor candidate number one, and a bunch of them show up to our meeting. They're gonna say their piece under public comment at the beginning of the meeting before we get to that issue. But when we get to the issue, then we would call on the person, the candidate, or probably the, the number one challenger, whoever challenges first, a first half report, then we go to the number one challenger, and then the candidates rep the defendant. And that would be the process, and that would be it. We won't be calling on anybody else who wants to testify on that particular candidate. Is that the idea? That would be my recommendation. Okay. And so, so we're allowing, by doing that, we're allowing people to speak to the issue that they are concerned about. We're not stopping anyone from commenting. We're right. providing I, one area where uh, this seems similar would be the, the redistricting commission. Um, as much as I'm in love with that commission and its work, um, I will point to that as an issue where they have the, the, the people speak beforehand, they have a time limit, and then they move on to the, to the business. I, I'm not sure if you're looking for a, a decision from us right now, but I think that makes sense in light of the amount of business we will have to accomplish. Uh, yeah, I mean, I think that's more in line with how public bodies generally handle public comment is to have a public comment paired at the beginning. So the the facts of each candidate, the signatures, I need signature, really. Every signature that you're proposing or someone's proposing a throw out will be public. So anybody can comment on that prior. They're not going to learn about it during our meeting. it will all be out in the public days before we have our meeting on May 26th. That's what we're saying here. Yeah, our staff report would be out that Monday, the Monday prior to the hearing. Okay. And in general, I mean, our reports are, you know, we, we make we make the agenda items. As long as a candidate who thinks they're at a close call and needs, they got to tell their people to bone up on the issue and get there and talk about it because when it comes up, we only get one shot at it. Okay. And that would not prohibit any of the attorneys or others working on behalf of these candidates or challengers from if they had somebody who you know had direct testimony they wanted to relate to this that would occur during that period not public comment yeah i think the chair and the, and the board would have discretion to yeah. you know get that testimony when they when they felt it was appropriate yeah. Yeah. there's got to be some discretion okay. I have one question that I forgot to ask earlier. Are these, I did see, um, I found a link 
on Bridge Magazine to one of the uh, challenges which had been filed. But I don't think any of the others are publicly available. And I wonder if you're making them available to us. We certainly can. I mean, they're, they're, they're public documents, so we can do that. It might help us in advance um, to see these um, prior to the time that we see your report. I will send what I have now. I assume I will you send have that it all. <laughs> yes. <laughs> okay. Thank you. Do you need anything from us, Jonathan, on that policy adoption? Well, I, I mean, Eric, would you recommend a motion on that? Or did you think that's not necessary? I think motion would hurt. Uh, I'm not entirely sure it's required, but. Well, this, this, for the sake of clarity, it may be helpful just to have a motion where the board states what it's, you know, how it intends to handle public comment. So essentially that the board will provide a public comment period at the beginning and then recognize, um, you know, the public comment at the beginning and then recognize this, the subjects of individual agenda items as they as they come up. Yeah, I, I think it's a more of a policy statement. I don't know if we need a motion, but let's just agree here that that we're a public comment at the beginning of the meeting and and we want people to comment on what they want to talk about for one of the agenda items. And when we get to that agenda item, we're, we may limit the uh, witnesses to very few, one, maybe two, uh, maybe one. And so they might not get to testify at that point in time. So we want them to talk in a public comment. That's the idea here. And that's what we want to get across. And I, I don't know, we want to leave, leave discretion there. Uh, what Tony just brought up about, depending on what the issue is, there could be a second attorney that wants to bring something up. And, and we don't want to say, sorry, you didn't do it on a public comment. You're not allowed to talk. I don't want to go that far. Leave the discretion there. But for the most part, if you want to just talk about a signature or two, you better do it under public comment. You might not get a chance uh, for timing. I'd give everybody in on a, in a day uh, for this meeting, uh, do it under public comment. That's what we recommend. So that's a statement made. And I guess you want to paraphrase that and get it out in public. Uh, let people know that are paying attention to this. They, they want to come in for public comment. Yeah, we'll be clear on the notice, uh, the meeting notices. Um, but that's how the board's going to handle it. Okay. okay, anything else for Jonathan or staff? Oh, uh, Adam has something. Sorry, go ahead. Adam. I will just say, so for the, for the meeting on the 26th, as far as petitions go to, I do bring the petitions. So if there are specific ones, there are voluminous. Um, because we're here, it'll be a little bit more logistically challenging than we've had before when we were at the Capitol where we could just run them over. Um, but as always, if there are ones that you want to physically come look at prior to the board meeting, just reach out and let me know. Um, board members in the past have uh, come before. I know Norm, you remember in other yeah. in other years going through to physical to look at the originals. Well, usually you're so, reasonable. I don't need to look at too many. I, that's <laughs> do our best. So just if that's all I would just say if the board wants okay. to just let me know. And if there are specifics that you want me to bring to the meeting, let me know. I am planning on bringing everybody that we will specifically be discussing at a minimum. Using your discretion and reasonableness is why you get paid what you do. You got to earn your wages in this next few weeks. This is important stuff we're doing, at least for the candidates in question. It is. And I have told Adam that the, the better he does his work, the less we That's will have sure. to That's do. for sure. That's for sure. No pressure. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Do you have anything here? I have nothing. Okay. Oh, uh, was that a question for litigation update? Yeah. I think the only case I'm aware of is the Graziano case, uh, which has been fully briefed, and we're yet to receive a date from the Court of Appeals for an argument. And what was that case deal with? Uh, that is kind of an extension of the Committee to Ban Fracking. Uh, it is based on uh, a lawsuit brought by signature signers rather than the petition proponents, but making essentially the, you know, the same kind of arguments about the, you know, why the petition should have been approved. It's amazing how these issues never go away, and the only people that benefit are the law firms, I swear. <laughs> I, I, I've lost track of how many years I've been working on the fracking issue. Okay. It's been a long time. Well, wow. okay. Seeing nothing else before the board. You got something you want to bring up, John? Number six. 
Number six. Oh yeah, we've been on that one. That's one we've been on that for a while. Since Anything before there. the board? What do you got before the board? Well, I think the best thing is to have public comment at the end. But uh, this bomb of the petitions is going to be. Uh, you're not giving people you read about in the paper that what's taking place, but there's no real information about it, and it should be more timely because you're gonna you're not gonna have a big enough room for this show on this uh, showdown meeting when it comes. So just anticipate that. Uh, well, we're gonna stream live, aren't we? We'll be streaming live, yes. John. They won't be able to get in the meeting here. <laughs> oh, you think show. everyone's gonna want to talk? Yeah. Well, I mean, it's gonna. That's all I'm saying. It's a bomb, and there needs to be some idea of what's. I read about it in the paper, but I don't know what how extensive this is. These people are going to be disqualified. I mean, this is mammoth, and it needs more. Well, it's lead mammoth time. for the candidate. That's for sure. It's mammoth for everybody. Yeah. But it needs the lead time. If you put it off, like you're talking about, it's going to be even worse. No, we're not putting anything off. No, I know that, but the, the announcements about the status. Is going to be put off until okay, this well, meeting. I think we're going to try to get out as soon as we can. Okay, anyway. And, and I think, uh, obviously, if somebody wants to comment on some signatures or uh, any uh, challenges, they can in writing, which we will accept. And the sooner they do that in writing, the sooner we can see it. You'll be filing stuff to us when you get it. But so have, the sooner the better. Have they notified these people of what's going on? Well, right, right now, yeah. the, 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 the response to the challenges isn't even due yet. So we're still in the middle of receiving information. I know, but it's the magnitude is is overwhelming. I'm shocked. That's all. To be honest, it is uh, unique what's going on right yeah. now. Anyway, the other thing I wanted to say is I was glad to uh, he about this issue of six months. You can turn the language in, so they didn't even know what was going on. So I appreciate learning that at this meeting. Yeah, and. Uh, so well, it's a can, conflict in the law, but it's, I'm still know. a little confused. Yeah. <laughs> I'm talking about Ohio County. If it has this different policy, yeah. that I well, always thought it was strange when township officials start December first as opposed to January one. But whatever, it's our constitution. So anyway, I'll turn in some more petitions so we can meet again. Okay, <laughs> thank you. Okay, John, do your job out there. Anything else? Seeing none, we're going to adjourn without objection. We're adjourned. That gamble doesn't sound, that gamble sounds a lot better. I'll use the one on the left, okay. I'm assuming ours.